Welcome to episode 94 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. In this episode, we get to speak to retired agent Russell Atkinson, who served in the FBI for 25 years. He specialized in investigating high technology crimes in Silicon Valley. Atkinson also worked on several kidnapping cases and has arrested murderers and drug dealers. In this episode, Russell Atkinson reviews the case of Charles Gresky, a wealthy Silicon Valley businessman kidnapped at gunpoint and held for four days before being rescued. After retiring from the FBI, Russell Atkinson, with degrees in law and mathematics, practiced law, and also worked for many high-tech firms in the computer industry, including IBM, Fairchild Semiconductor, and AOL. Now completely retired, he spends most of his time writing crime fiction and is the author of eight mystery novels. His book, Held for Ransom, is a fictionalized account of the kidnapping of a wealthy Silicon Valley executive and it was inspired by the Gresky case. You can learn more about Russell Atkinson and his books at his website, Cliff Knowles Mysteries. Now, of course, this case that we're talking about, the Charles Gresky kidnapping, is all true. But you can imagine, as a mystery writer, Russell Atkinson is a great storyteller. So I really think you're going to enjoy this interview. But before we get to the interview, I just want to say that I hope you had a fantastic Thanksgiving and to invite you, if you're not already, to become a member of my FBI in books, TV and movie reader team. Once a month, I send out a digest of the episodes introduced the month before my crime fiction recommendations, and I curate different articles about the FBI in books, TV and movies. If you want to become a member of my reader team, all you need to do is go to my website, jerrywilliams.com and sign up when you see the pop up or go to my Facebook author page, Jerry Williams author and sign up there. If you want to take a quick peek at what I put out every month, you can always go to my website at jerrywilliams.com backslash newsletter and take a look. Thank you. Now here's the show. I'm excited to introduce my guest, Russell Atkinson. Hi, Russ. Hello, Jerry. How are you? I'm good. Now, I am always looking for retired agents to interview about exciting FBI cases. And I'm not sure how I learned about you, but I know that you have an exciting case because it was so good that you actually turned it into a crime mystery novel. Well, I did. Um, It's a novel, and I will say there is uh, definitely a lot of fiction in it, but it is based on a case that I worked that was the most intense one uh, of my career. And that was a kidnapping case? It was. Well, before we get to it, I do want to tell you that you are my author role model. And why is that? Because I'm just starting out as a crime fiction writer, and you actually have eight mysteries. So I look to you for wisdom and guidance as I move forward in my career. I hope I uh, I can count on you to, to call you every now and then and uh, ask for your advice. Well, you certainly can, uh, but I have to warn you, I've never made the New York Times bestseller list. So uh, don't, uh, don't quit your day job. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, and we'll talk more about your writing career at the end, but let's start right away talking about this kidnapping case because it's pretty fascinating. I I doubt seriously if there are as many kidnapping for ransom cases as you know we would think because of movies and books and TV. Well, that's true. Uh, they're quite rare, at least in this country. I can't really uh, speak about other countries, but uh, I have heard different percentages or numbers given about how many uh, 
kidnapping reports are real, but the fact is not only are kidnapping for ransom rare, but most kidnapping reports uh, turn out to be false. They're usually hoaxes, pranks, runaways, uh, just kids coming late from curfew and that sort of thing. All right. So can you set the stage for this one? I mean, where did it occur? When did it occur? Who was involved? Sure. It was 1992. This was uh, in Silicon Valley. There's a number of cities in Silicon Valley. The uh, the company was Adobe Systems. I think most people are familiar with it. It's got Photoshop and Adobe Acrobat. It's a big software company. They're located in Mountain View, where they were at that time. They aren't there now. They've moved. The victim was Charles Geschke. Uh, he went by the name Chuck. Uh, he was the president and co-founder of Adobe. I take it he was a pretty wealthy man. He was, and in fact, that was a an issue because he had just been highlighted in the uh, local paper, the Mercury News, as one of the new tech millionaires. And then, in fact, that turns out to have been why he was targeted for this kidnapping, although we didn't know it till later. So when was the first time that you became aware of this kidnapping? Well, it began for me when I got a call shortly after dinner. Uh, this was in May 1992. The call was from Dave Zadie, the violent crime supervisor in San Francisco. I was the principal release supervisor on the violent crime squad in San Jose. Uh, San Jose is a resident agency, or what we call an RA, out of San Francisco division. Dave had been unable to reach my supervisor, Ken Thompson, so he called me as the next guy in line. He said that the CEO of Adobe had just called in to the San Francisco office to report a kidnapping. As he told it, uh, the wife of the president, Chuck Geschke, um, had told him that her husband had been kidnapped and that she'd received a ransom call. Zadie said he needed me to get full details from the CEO and then go interview uh, Nan Geschke, the wife. Zadie would then continue to try to reach my supervisor. So that's how it started for me. I went ahead and called the CEO. Uh, he said that uh, Nan had called him about 1 p.m. and asked him to meet her at a nearby shopping center. She wouldn't tell him what it was about, but said it was urgent and very important. Um, I think he stopped by Chuck's office to see if Chuck knew what it was about. Uh, since his wife was calling. But Chuck's secretary said that he hadn't been in that morning. So the CEO went ahead and went down to the shopping center where Nan said she was going to be. Uh, she didn't show up for about half an hour or even longer. Um, so he was a little concerned. But she did show up uh, exhausted and uh, very upset, very distraught. She had walked all the way from her house, three miles away, and she told him that Chuck had been kidnapped. According to her, uh, he'd left for work as usual that morning, but uh, when she had called him there at work in order to schedule some kind of travel, his secretary said that he'd never arrived. This obviously confused her. So after repeated attempts to reach him at the office, she had driven to Adobe and found Chuck's car in its usual spot she decided to move the car to a far part of the parking lot so that if he returned, he'd have to call her to find out where it was. It sounds yeah. like maybe maybe she didn't trust him, that she thought you know he might have been up to no good. Well, it's interesting you say that because um, it caused a lot of uh, odd speculation on the part of... Uh, all of us in the FBI, let's just say. Uh, it, it, it wasn't a normal start to a kidnapping if there is such, such a thing. I don't think there's a textbook case, but if there is one, this is definitely not one. So what she did then, she went ahead and uh, returned home, and she uh, began making a cake for a social event that evening. Then at 12.30, uh, she'd, she'd gotten a call from someone with an accent who said that Chuck had been kidnapped, and they were demanding a ransom. They told her he'd been taken to Mexico. Uh, she'd become very upset, didn't know what to do, so she'd called the CEO and asked him to meet her. 
So they had just met, and she handed him a note, which she had handwritten on a small kitchen memo pad. And I'm going to go ahead and read you that note. I was able to get a copy of that. And it's part of what made this case rather odd and unusual. So here's what the note said. I got a call from man said Chuck is kidnapped. $650,000 in hundreds day after tomorrow. I will be at party tonight. See you there. I have to do cake. Strawberry okay? Otherwise, they can see me. Chuck will be killed if we tell. I don't know what to do. What do you say? I have no time. Must walk. Made not suspicious. So that's the end of the note. Oh, that is strange. I I can see the rest of the note, but the the see you at party and the strawberry cake makes you think, well, maybe he isn't kidnapped. You know, is she playing a joke? What You know, what's going on? Well, that's exactly the thinking of several of the people. Uh, So I asked the CEO what he thought, and he said he didn't know what to believe, but that Chuck had not shown up at the office, and the car was, in fact, in the lot. So I asked him if he'd called the police. He said no, that uh, he'd only called the FBI based on his attorney's advice, and that was because of the fact that, uh, according to her, they had said he'd been taken to Mexico. So I'm not sure that a business attorney is the right one to be asking about criminal uh, criminal cases, but he had simply looked at it as a pure jurisdictional thing, saying, well, if he's taken interstate, that's pure FBI, so you don't call the local police. But, but that made it an unusual case, because I don't think I've ever heard of a case where the police weren't uh, involved or at least uh, advised of a kidnapping for ransom. Yeah, that, that's true. So... And I'm I'm sure you're going to get into this, but did you end up working with the local police in any way? Not during the entire time of the of the kidnapping. Afterwards, uh, it turns out that we were able to determine that uh, he had not been taken interstate. So they were brought into the case uh, only really at at the end for purposes of prosecution. Okay, this is already starting out so interesting. I can't wait to hear what else happens. Okay, so um, I got the uh, full story from from the the CEO, and uh, told him that I needed to speak with uh, directly with Mrs. Get, uh, Geske, with Nancy. So he gave me her number, but he said he wasn't sure she'd agree to talk. She was obviously upset that somebody might be watching her. That's why she'd walked, and that's why um, she had been very circumspect on the phone. So I hung up with the CEO, and then I called her home number and identified myself. She was very skittish about talking on the phone and told me she couldn't talk there. But I finally convinced her to meet me, and she agreed, but said she was keeping her regular schedule uh, so that the kidnappers wouldn't wouldn't think she was in touch with the, the police. And she was leaving for the local community college where she volunteered at the TV station. Um, I would have to meet her there. And she said I should dress casually, not like an FBI agent, and come to the TV studio and pretend to be a family friend, and she'd talk to me there. As soon as I hung up, my phone rang again. Uh, This time it was uh, Ken Thompson, my squad supervisor. Dave Zadie had not been able to reach him before, but he'd gotten in touch and briefed him. And Ken uh, had been trying to reach me. Of course, I was tied up on the phone. So I explained the situation to him. And he said that he had notified the SAC, that's uh, Dick Hell, a special agent in charge, if there's any non-FBI people out there listening, and that they discussed the case with Zadie, and it sounded flaky to them based on the little that they knew. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, keep in mind, a lot of uh, reported kidnappings do turn out to be other things. So, it's pretty reasonable to be skeptical. So. Chuck Geske was a logical target for someone who was seeking a rich uh, victim to ransom. We didn't know this at the time, but he had been highlighted in the paper uh, as a, a new tech millionaire. So um, so that led some credibility to this. So Ken told me I should go ahead and talk to Nan, and they'd get someone else to go debrief the CEO more thoroughly. So I went ahead and did what uh, she had asked. I put on a ratty corduroy sport coat and uh, jeans and went to the college I met Nan there, and she followed me out to my bureau car. 
I tried to begin the interview with the uh, usual important questions, such as the details of the ransom call. Did he have any enemies, uh, or any, was there any sign as to who might have done this, and so forth. But she insisted on telling the story her way from the very beginning of the day. She went into great uh, detail about her plans to bake a cake for a party that night and needing to talk to Chuck about scheduling. And without going into a lot of detail, I can just tell you it, that it was a long and very difficult interview. She was really too scared to make much sense. And soon after we got started, my pager started going off. Um, and it was a phone phone number I didn't recognize. I, I knew all the office numbers, and it wasn't that. So um, I told her it might be important, but I still hadn't gotten to the uh, to the point where I'd heard about the ransom call. Now, you have to keep in mind this is 1992, and very few people had cell phones back then. She didn't have one, and I didn't have one either. So I tried to radio the FBI office to see who it was who was trying to trying to get me. But I couldn't get through. And this is something uh, I've told this story to other agents, and a lot of times they find this part hard to believe that uh, I'm not in radio contact in a bureau car with the the office, either the San Jose office or the San Francisco office. But in fact, um, that's the case out in San Francisco, at least it was back then. They only had radio contact about two thirds of the time. It's a very hilly area, and they don't have repeaters on every hill. So uh, that particular time, I just could not radio to the office. Nobody would answer up. Wow. So anyway, I went ahead and just finished my interview. Um, I knew they were waiting to talk to me, but it took about 40 minutes uh, before I finally got her to tell me the the full account of the ransom call. If I ever tried to ask a question, she would start all over again from the beginning. So I learned not to not to interrupt her and just let her go. After I finally got what I thought was enough detail, I told her that I really had to to get to a phone so I could call in and report what she had told me. So I suggested that we go somewhere with a landline. She didn't want to go to her house because she thought people would be watching. So we agreed to go to the CEO's house. So we did. I drove her there. Uh, When we got there, two agents from my squad were already there. Uh, Nan practically fell into the arms of the CEO's wife. It was obvious I was not going to be able to complete the interview. Everyone was hovering around and asking her if she was okay. She was obviously terrified and crying. At that point, were you starting to to believe her? I was. Um, I don't know exactly when, but even before then, during the course of telling the story, uh, I could tell she was really upset and uh, and scared. So so I believed her. I wouldn't say right from the from the beginning. Uh, I was definitely. Uh, a bit skeptical, but uh, but she had convinced me during the course of the interview. So I immediately asked to use the phone, and I called Ken, my supervisor. He told me the SAC had been trying to reach me. So that's what that uh, the paging had been. It was the SAC's uh, home phone number. So I called the SAC, he's the boss, and uh, I apologized for my tardy response and explained about the absence of the radio contact. And he asked me what I thought. In particular, was it a hoax or a real kidnapping? And I told him I thought it was real. The, the victim was a logical target, and Nan seemed to me to be genuinely terrified. It became obvious to me at that point that he was very skeptical that this was a real kidnapping. But uh, we always take these things as real, uh, even if we have our doubts. So he directed me to get uh, consent to monitor the home phones and then go to the Geshki house and look for signs of violence or anything else of significance. I acknowledged this and hung up with him, but I thought the uh, the statement about looking for signs of violence, well, I thought that was significant, and it it made it gave me pause uh, because if she was telling the truth, the kidnapping would have had to have taken place in the parking lot of Adobe, which is in Mountain View, and uh, they live several miles away in the town of Los Altos. So that told me that he thought that uh, her story wasn't true and that uh, there there might have been some kind of domestic thing going on back at her back at the house. But in any event, um I had my instructions. So I went I talked to Nan and I explained what I needed. Uh and she did give me her key code and signed a consent form to monitor the phone. 
So then I called Ken back and let him know what the SEC had directed me to do. Uh, he told me that um, he had called in one of the most senior agents on the squad who was convinced that this was some kind of hoax or scam or a domestic situation. This agent, I'll just call him the case agent, <laughs> because that's what he turned out to be. He, he cited all the things that were odd about this case. You and I have already mentioned a bunch of those, and especially uh, why she was so fixated on the cake. And, um, you know, would she really be worried about what flavor cake to make if her husband had just been kidnapped? So anyway, Ken told me that he was assigning the case to this agent, so he was going to be the case agent. But uh, he was going to let the agent go on his vacation the next day to Disneyland with his family because the previous year, the same agent had a Disneyland vacation plan and had prepaid everything, and then he couldn't go because of a, a trial. So he ended up losing his deposits and not being able to, to take the vacation. So it was pretty clear that Ken also didn't think this thing was, was real. And uh, so... I'd never heard of a case where the case agent was absent for the entire case. Uh, have you ever heard of that, Jerry? No, it, it doesn't. It just doesn't sound fair. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the next thing was uh, I went ahead and went over to the to the house. Uh, Ken had told me he was going to send somebody else to finish debriefing Nan at the CEO's house. So I did. I went over to the house and I searched. But I didn't see anything significant. Uh, two other agents did show up shortly after that. They joined me, and we searched the interior and the exterior. Didn't see anything of note. There were two agents also sent to do the phone monitoring, tech agents. So they uh, they arrived, and it was a very uh, challenging job technically because it was by now it was getting it was around midnight, and it was pitch black outside. And, of course, they didn't want to be operating with flashlights prowling around or looking like they were prowling around outside of a house uh, with flashlights. So they uh, they had to do the outside hookup in the dark with little pin lights. And they came back inside, and they set up uh, the usual uh, second phone connected to the main phone. And they tested it, and everything was working fine. So a little time went by, and the CEO and his wife arrived uh, with Nan. They brought her home from their house. This was now well after midnight. This was around 1 a.m. And once she was safely inside, they left. I explained to her what we had done, that we'd uh, set up on her phone. And she seemed very upset at that time, even more upset than, than before. I've seen a later interview that she did, and she described it later as a, that she had been through a six-hour interrogation. So she was definitely frazzled, and of course, there's uh, it started with uh, her all her tension and fear about her hu her husband being kidnapped. So this six-hour interrogation, she's talking about her initial interview with you, and then with the follow-up interview of the two agents that went over to the CEO's house to, to talk to her some more. That's right. Uh, there were actually, I think, three agents. Uh, Ken had called yet another agent in who'd been to a kidnapping school and uh, had sent him over there, too. So um, he was the one who'd been doing um, the lengthiest interview with her. And that, so uh, I had only spent about 40 minutes or so uh, with her, as I said, before we left for the, the CEO's house. Uh, so... I, I don't know if her, if her timeline is accurate, but that's the way she described it in an interview. And certainly, uh, I didn't consider my interview with her an, an interrogation, but I guess that's the way she felt. And did she but, feel that way because she detected or thought that she might not have been believed? And just the way the questions were being asked, that she felt defensive? Well, I haven't heard her say that, but I suspect that's the case. Uh, I think that the agent who was sent in to interview her was probably told that this sounded flaky to find out if she's really telling the truth kind of thing. But I wasn't present for that interview, and I don't want to characterize anybody else's professionalism uh, in the interview or anything like that. So uh, I'm sure he had a number of good questions and so on. But she was she was pretty, uh, like I say, illogical with me, so I can understand anybody being skeptical. 
But anyway, uh, the first thing she did after I told her about the phone was she went over and she she picked up the phone and it was dead. She said, "What have you done?" So I picked I picked up the phone and listened, and sure enough, it was a dead line. There was no dial tone. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. So uh, the uh, that guy had just tested it uh, a few minutes before and it was fine, but uh, at that moment it wasn't. And then. As she was starting to challenge us, she was obviously very upset. And uh, at that moment, uh, an agent came to the the back door, the sliding glass door. I remember this vividly. And it was the agent who had been uh, interviewing her or interrogating her uh, back at the, the CEO's house. He came to join us there. And she started uh, screaming at me, don't let him in, don't let him in. I tried to calm her down. but she And she has even described it this way later that she she lost it basically is uh, the way the way she's put it she withdrew her consent she told us all to get out that um, to take our all our phone equipment away and she was afraid that the kidnappers were going to call and wouldn't be able to get through and she was sorry she'd cooperated with the FBI so there was nothing we could do without her consent so that's what we did we pulled off the monitoring equipment and left that was a very surreal beginning to this case. Absolutely. So let's fast forward to, to the next morning because uh, although there was a lot of discussion, I did meet, um, I, I drove back and I met with the case agent uh, who was about to leave for Disneyland. And he told me that uh, in the morning we would find Chuck's hand sticking up out of a out of the back garden. So that shows you uh, his take on the case. He just thought it was a domestic situation. So they were thinking that she had possibly done something with her husband and was using the kidnapping and the ransom as a ruse to explain why all of a sudden he was missing. Uh, that's correct, except for one thing. I wouldn't use the the, the term they were thinking. Uh, this one agent thought that, but I don't think that everybody else did. By this time, I had talked to Ken and the SAC and told them I, I thought it was real. And she would have to have been a very good actress to have pulled it off if it was something like that. So Ken had told me uh, that, well, it, it may be a hoax or a scam of some kind or, or cover-up, but uh, it might be real. And if it's real, it doesn't matter that uh, the, the other agent is the case agent because the SAC is going to take over anyway. So I think they were keeping an open mind, most of them. But this one agent, I think maybe he was a little biased because he really wanted to get to Disneyland. And, and the, the next morning, uh, despite this surreal uh, beginning, Palmer Hedge prevailed. Nan had calmed down and been convinced by the CEO to cooperate. We put the phone monitoring back on uh, in in the daylight. All the connections were better, and it worked fine. Uh, Nan gave uh, all her domestic help off. I think she had a, a maid and a gardener. And so they were told not to come in for the next few days. Several agents were assigned to be present with her, including a couple of female agents. Her daughter, Kathy, was brought in uh, to be with her as well and to help with the ransom because it it seemed pretty clear that Nan was just having trouble coping with it. And uh, Nan and Kathy was uh, viewed as being a level head. And so she was brought in and she was told the whole situation. So, Could you tell uh, us a little bit about Kathy, how old she was and you know where she uh, lived? Yeah, she she lived locally uh in the Bay Area. I don't I think she if I remember correctly, she was living over in Berkeley. Uh maybe she was going to school there. So she was I believe college age, although I'm not positive she was still in college, but she was in her 20s uh and she had her act together, I can tell you. She she did a great job. We'll we'll get into to what she did, but uh Anyway, the case was treated as real, uh, even if there were skeptics uh, some, somewhere in there. And, and that's what the FBI does. We're a professional organization. So uh, I can tell you that that afternoon, the first recorded ransom call came in. And, of course, uh, once that happened, that changed the whole complexion. Everybody knew we're going to treat this as real, even if the ransom call was somehow part of the hoax. That, you know, that she wasn't lying about there being a call. Let me skip what we were doing at that point and go back to what Chuck Geschke was doing, because later investigation told us what he experienced that first day. 
Uh, right. So, so this is um, this is what we learned about him. He arrived at his office in the morning and parked in his usual spot. As he got out of his car, a young man with black hair approached him, asking directions. Uh, as Chuck turned to help him, the man stuck a gun in his ribs and ordered him into his car. There was another man already in the driver's seat. They got in the back seat. The kidnappers put duct tape over his eyes and then covered those with sunglasses so people from the outside couldn't see that there was duct tape on there. They told him he was being kidnapped, and if he tried to escape, that uh, he would be killed. The kidnappers said that they had planted a bomb at his house, and they would trigger the bomb with a control device. If he tried anything, his whole family would be blown up. The man with the gun introduced himself as Steve, and he said the other man was Rock, like like Rocky. Steve quizzed him about how much of his assets could be made liquid. As they were driving away from uh, the Adobe headquarters, he was asking him about how much money he had and how much of it could be made liquid. Chuck, uh, I use first name for all the guest geese because there's Chuck, there's Nan, there's Kathy, so uh, we'll just, it's easier if we keep track of everybody by first name. He minimized uh, the amount as much as he could, emphasizing uh, restrictive SEC rules for insiders because most of his wealth was in Adobe stock and uh, insiders can't trade freely in such stock. So they continued to drive south and finally they stopped at a motel. Uh, we aren't sure where, but somewhere near the southern end of San Jose. Uh, they told them. Uh, Steve apparently told the motel clerk that their friend was sick and uh, not to disturb them. And he, they asked for a room in the back, away out of uh, out of view of the highway. They led Chuck into the room and turned on the TV. The the movie Ghost was playing. Uh, that's something we we eventually learned. So there was that scene. That I I don't remember the details of the scene, but I had it described to me later by the people involved in this whole thing. It was, a, again, another surreal part of the of the whole show. So uh, so that's what he went through on the first day. Kidnapped at gunpoint, was taken down and put in a motel. What happened on the phone call, uh, everyone agreed that Kathy was the best person to handle it, so she was the one who, who took it. Uh, the nature of a real ransom call, I think, is really different from what the public sees on TV. Uh, if it's okay with you, I'll just read some excerpts because I actually have a transcript of that first call. Great, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, may I speak to Nancy, please? I'm sorry, she's sick right now. Can I take a message? It's urgent. I have to speak to her. Uh, may I ask who's calling? Just tell her it's regarding her husband. Well, I'm sorry, she's sick. She's practically in the hospital. This is her daughter, Kathy. Okay, good. Listen. You tell your mom, do not do anything stupid. We know everything about you and your brother. She is being watched. We know the house. We know everything about you people. Anything stupid, your dad will die. You understand? Well, we fully intend to. Do you understand? Yes, I do, but we fully understand. Good. I have a mess. I have a, listen, I have a recorded message from your dad. I want you to listen very carefully. Hold on. And then he played this recorded message. Hello, Nan. This is Chuck. I love you very much. I'm sick. At the moment, I'm okay. I'm being treated well. The people who have me are very serious. You should follow their directions. Please don't report to the authorities. Our lives could be in danger. They're watching the house. I love you very much. So that was the entire recording. And I'm wow. Gonna more the, and I'm going to read some more of the transcripts here. Kathy, is my dad safe? Yes. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. Good. Now listen to me very, very carefully. Okay. We're watching you 24 hours a day. We know everything about you. Any stupid move, you get your dad back in pieces. You understand now? Yes. I told your mom yesterday what we need is $650,000 in a $100 bill. Okay. The money must be circulated and marked and traced. Okay. You should have the money by June 5th. That gives you seven business days for from tomorrow. Um, is there any way we can get him earlier if I have the money by tomorrow? If you have the money by tomorrow, we'll contact you tomorrow. You will stay at your dad's house. You'll, uh, you'll stay at your mom's house. I will contact you tomorrow evening. If you have the money, that's fine. You will make the drop for me. Nobody else. 
you're going to be using your mom's Jaguar. You understand? Okay. Make sure nobody knows. If anything happens, can I say hello to my dad? No, your dad's in a safe place. He's outside the state. He's where? He's not in the state. He's not in California. He's been transported to another state. Once we have the money, he'll be released after 12 hours. Is there anything else? No. That's it. Operator, please deposit five cents. Talk to you tomorrow. I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right, bye. So, as bizarre as it sounds, that's uh, that's what a real ransom call sounds like. Uh, obviously, everything changed. If there were any doubters, uh, they were silenced. Subtle aspects of the call immediately took on importance. Uh, the caller spoke with what sounded like a Mexican accent. He was clearly nervous and unsophisticated. Kathy did a tremendous job of keeping him talking and following FBI instructions. She pressed for proof that her father was alive. We at least got his recorded voice, although he wasn't speaking live on the line. Now, the ransom amount of $650,000 struck everyone as odd and yet significant. Jerry, can you tell me what you would make of that $650,000 demand? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I yeah. feel bad. I can't answer the question. Well, neither could we. So don't feel bad. Oh. But you know, okay. why, why not a million or half a million? Why right. six hundred? You know, ransom demands are usually round numbers. Uh, so there was a lot of speculation going on with that. Uh, someone suggested it must be a particular debt that was owed. Uh, mm-hmm. Someone else thought it might be an amount uh, the kidnapper wanted for a purchase, such as for a house. Back in 1992, you could actually buy a very nice house in Silicon Valley for $650,000, but uh, you can't today, I can tell you that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, the caller suggested that they had a sizable number of people in their operation, and they were watching the house. Uh, kidnappers often claim this, and it's almost never true. But nothing could be ruled out in such cases. So let me ask you this. If they had been watching the house, would they have been able to tell that the FBI was there, that authorities had been called? Or were you guys being very careful about going in and out of the property? Yes, we were being very careful. There was a side door. Um, it's fortunate that their, their house was on a corner uh Sort of a corner. There was this long driveway that led uh, off the, off the main street down into uh, what was actually a park. Uh, so you, you could start. You could drive down that driveway and park um, in the small park, parking lot at the park at the, at the bottom of the hill, and then walk back up and come in the side door. So that's how they were getting in and out. Now, the statement about the money being circulated and marked and traced confused us. Circulated makes sense, so the bills don't look new. A lot of times, um, kidnappers or extortionists who want to pay off do ask for circulated bills, so they don't look new. But why would they want them marked and traced? And frankly, we never got an explanation for that. Later, we just decided that he meant unmarked and untraced. Right, because that's what law enforcement would do, is to mark them so that they could be traceable, that you could identify the ransom money later. Exactly. So uh, so this told us that he was unsophisticated, he was nervous. The fact that he said uh, Chuck had been taken to another state, that right off the bat contradicted what he told Nan. He had told her that he had been taken to Mexico. So we didn't think this was really a sophisticated gang or anybody else. We, it sounded like somebody who had who was winging it, basically. Unfortunately, uh, even though we had coordinated with the telephone company, the call was not traced in real time. It wasn't until the next day that we learned the call had been placed from a phone booth in Santa Cruz County. It wasn't until the billing information came through the phone company system that uh, that we got that. That's about. 50 miles south of Mountain View, where the Adobe headquarters uh, were. It's in in a different county. Uh, Of course, after that, uh, everything went into into high gear. Uh, The FCC ordered the SWAT team to start special training and uh, review their procedures. Surveillance squads were taken off their normal assignments and put onto a, a standby shift, early and late shifts, to be able to 
to do a surveillance at any time if the drop orders were given, that sort of thing. Nan had made clear that she would pay the ransom. Not every family agrees to that, and not every family can pay the ransom, and the government doesn't pay it. So arrangements had to be made to obtain the cash. Now, the Federal Reserve Bank does maintain bundles of money that have already been photographed, prepped, uh, marked in whatever way that that they mark them, so that uh, the family can, in fact, just transfer, do a wire transfer to the Federal Reserve Bank, and and they will provide that same amount of money uh, in suitable form to the FBI. So that was one of the things that was done. We also took the recorded call, and that was sent back to an expert uh, back east to try to get further hints about his accent, his education, or any other useful clues about the kidnapper. That was the first 24 hours, uh, the most, at least for me, the most intense uh, part of the whole, the whole incident. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about what took place over the next uh, few days. Uh, we don't have enough time for one thing. I'd like to protect some of the methods that we use. But basically, we did prepare the ransom package in a number of ways that would help us recover it. We did get some more ransom calls. The caller made two more calls, each time giving Kathy detailed instructions on what to wear, uh, what car to drive, uh, but he wouldn't give the exact time or place of the payoff. The calls are very similar to the first one with him with the kidnapper being rattled and uh, using what I would describe as a false bravado, ordering her very curtly. He wanted Kathy to drive the Jaguar, but at our urging, she claimed it wasn't drivable. And she was very skillful in convincing him of this. Anybody listening to her would have believed that that Jaguar just wasn't working. So they ended up uh, settling on the Cadillac. So why didn't you want her to drive the Jaguar? Because the Jaguar was a two-seater convertible, and we wanted to put an agent in the car with her. The Cadillac was a big car. He could hide down in the uh, the footwell in the rear seat area, out of sight, and be there to protect Kathy if something happened. You know, if if the kidnapper ended up approaching the car with Kathy in it, he could be there. Um, In the Jaguar, there was no place for him to hide, basically. So that was why we had... We had done that. We also we also thought we could get a bureau radio into the Cadillac since it was an American make, and the Jaguar, of course, was a British make, and wouldn't have all the, you know, they'd have metric this and that and different kinds of uh, electrical connections. So everybody wanted the Cadillac, and she succeeded in convincing with that. We did get some more recordings of Chuck uh, reading the current newspaper headlines, so we knew he was still alive. The kidnapper. In the second or third call, said that Chuck would be released in San Francisco an hour after the payment. Well, again, this was not con- consistent with what he'd said before. Uh, supposedly, he was in Mexico or in another state, and there's no way you could get somebody to San Francisco within an hour. So he was a liar. I mean, that's pretty much what what we knew from the beginning. Well, let me ask you another question because initially he told her. You know, they would give up to six to seven days to get the money. And that seems so strange. You would think that they would want, they would be stressing, let's get this done as soon as possible. I need the money immediately, not automatically give them a week. I know. Um, Well, as we learned later, it was largely because of what Chuck Geschke was telling them. He was doing a very good job as a victim. And maybe this is a good point for me to switch to what um, he was going through at that point during these days. As I mentioned, Stephen Rock questioned him about his assets. He told him that he thought his family could only get together about $300,000 cash. Now, he didn't really know how much cash he could do, so he was, he was lowballing it, but he didn't, he didn't have an honest knowledge of exactly how much could be converted into liquid form. Rock, the driver, believed him, but Steve did not. And Steve was the guy in charge. Uh, he was the one making the phone calls. So those two kidnappers argued about uh, what ransom to demand. Steve wanted to ask for uh, $1 million originally to be split 50-50. But Rock thought that was too much and would bring in the police or that they simply couldn't do it and wouldn't, wouldn't pay at all because they couldn't come up with the money. 
So what happened was Steve decided to double cross Rock. He told Rock that he had agreed to ask for only three hundred thousand dollars, but in fact he kept his own plan to get his five hundred thousand. So what Rock thought was going to happen was they were going to split three hundred thousand fifty fifty, and he would get a hundred and fifty. But if you if you do the math, you'll find out that five hundred thousand plus one hundred and fifty adds up to six hundred fifty thousand dollars. So so no one had guessed this. So what Rock was planning to do, he was going to keep five hundred thousand out of that six six fifty and give Rock one hundred fifty. And uh, uh, this was largely due to Chuck's own lowballing of the information. See, apparently Steve had complained to Chuck about how his daughter kept it wasn't just obeying instructions that she was arguing with him and trying to convince him of a different car and doing uh, different things like that and he he commented that uh you know, she doesn't understand who's really the boss here uh, which Chuck got a kind of a kick out of although he was very frightened and so forth but when he picked up on the fact that Kathy was asking to use the uh, Cadillac he actually figured out there that uh, maybe she was in touch with the FBI or the police and they had wanted to put somebody in the car with her for her safety. And so he convinced Steve that, in fact, the, uh, the Jaguar was having problems. It had like, transmission problems and probably wasn't drivable. It could be unreliable on the, on the night of the, of the drop of the payoff. So Steve was getting it from, from both ends. Chuck Geske did a lot of things right as, as a victim, I can tell you that, and helped, uh, helped us in the case. This is just one example of that. Wow. So he was, yeah. The second day, uh, he had been driven from that motel down to a house uh, in a town called Hollister. It's a farming community about uh, 60 miles south of Mountain View. He was shackled in a closet and kept blindfolded there. Uh, they questioned him, of course, about... Uh, not only the money, but his whole family. He, they wanted the names, the locations of his children, what cars they drove, and so on. They would go out and get uh, food for him. It was all from fast food. And they did ask him what he wanted. They'd order what he wanted. Uh, so in a sense, he was. Uh, they were being considerate. But at the same time, they were constantly making threats against him and his family. Rock was a... Uh, a weightlifter, a bodybuilder, and he could be heard lifting weights in the next room, even though Chuck was still blindfolded. He, he could hear the weights hitting the floor. So Steve was uh, definitely the one in charge. Uh, at one point, he took Chuck to uh, to one of the rooms, to one of the other rooms, and had him feel the smooth nose of something Steve said was a personal submarine. And it did feel like what? that. But Yes, um, and he said that he was. That's how he was going to pick up the ransom and drive away in a in a uh, in a submarine. That's how he was going to fool any uh, police that might be there. He was bragging about that. Uh, in fact, what it turned out to be, as we learned later, it was one of those underwater tows. I don't know if you remember the Jacques Cousteau uh, TV programs. If you're as old oh, yeah. as me. You might even re remember Lloyd Bridges and Sea Hunt. I, uh, yeah, I have to admit, I do remember that, but I was really young, really, yeah, really young. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's those underwater tow things that they, they used to you know, pull, pull them around underwater, pull scuba divers around. And Steve, uh, as it happened, was an experienced scuba diver. So his escape plan was to make the payoff at a beach and escape underwater using the tow. When Steve questioned Chuck about the cars, he, like I said, he had supported um, Kathy's view that uh, they had to use a Cadillac. There was one horrible coincidence I should mention at this point. At the same time this was going on, there was another kidnapping case going on back east. I don't know if you've heard of it. It was in New Jersey. Sidney Riso was an oil executive, and he'd been kidnapped and held for ransom. He'd, he'd actually been kidnapped uh, before Chuck Eschke had. I don't know if that had anything to do with the thinking of the kidnappers. At the time all this was going on, Riso had not been heard from for, for a while. All that was known publicly was that he had been kidnapped, a ransom call had come in, that the family had tried to make a payoff, and that the kidnappers had never shown. So the payoff, the money had never been picked up. And several days had gone by, and so there was a lot of speculation uh, in fact, S Sidney R uh, Rizzo had been killed. Uh, mm. Nobody knew it at the time, but 
there was a lot of speculation that that he had been killed, and that's why the kidnapper never picked up the ransom that they couldn't deliver the body, and they were worried about a murder case. And that speculation turned out to be true later. But we were really worried that the family would hear about this. You know, they could withdraw their consent at any moment if if they. Uh, heard. It's so rare to have a kidnapping for ransom, but here we had two going on at the same time on opposite coasts. Friday. That week, the final instructions came from the caller. Steve told Kathy to drive south to the town of Marina. It's a small seaside town near Monterey. Uh, Before I get to that, I can just tell you that uh, even though there were two other phone calls during the uh, course of this thing, we were never able to catch the caller at the phone booth. That's what we wanted to do, but it never happened. Uh, We just couldn't trace him fast enough. Uh, Did he make all of his calls from the same phone booth? No, no. We'd always find out within 24 hours or sometimes even within a few minutes after the call. But they were from three different phones. Uh, All of them were south of Silicon Valley. They were in South San Jose or in Santa Cruz County or Monterey County. So we definitely thought that's where they were. But this could have been consistent with having taken them all the way to Mexico and somebody still up here. It was obviously it was still a long ways away. But in any event, um, we never were able to pinpoint. We always wanted to catch the guy right in the act at the phone booth, but it never happened. So Friday afternoon, the final instructions came from the caller. The guy who called himself Steve uh, told Kathy to drive south to the town of Marina. It's a small seaside town near Monterey. The drop-off point was a dead-end street that fronted onto a public beach. Uh, the designated time was 11 p.m., So the the payoff plan was set in motion, uh, but it did take longer than expected to get Kathy into a bulletproof vest, and the agent in the Cadillac couldn't get his radio to make uh, contact with the trail car. Unknown to him, due to a communications error, confusion back at the command post in San Jose, the trail car had been dispatched to the drop site. I don't want to go into that, but it was... uh, it was chaos when the actual instructions came. So somewhere along the line, there was a communication there, and the command went out for everybody to go south to uh, towards this place in, in Marina. And the, the car that was supposed to be tailing the Cadillac left with everybody else. <sighs> not only that, but they had not been able to get a bureau radio installed into the uh, Cadillac um, for whatever reason. There were just technical problems. So uh, the only radio contact they had was there, there was a SWAT agent in the car with Kathy hidden uh, down in the the, uh, the footwell area, the back seat. And, of course, he was armed and he had a radio. And uh, But his radio was just a handy talkie. And without the tail car behind him, he was not in radio contact with anybody. So it was a little scary at that point, I can tell you. I take it that this SWAT agent who's in the back of the car with Kathy has no idea that the trail car is not behind them. That's correct. He just kept trying to raise him on his handy talkie, and he wasn't getting any response. They had given him his own tactical channel. Now, I don't know if you've ever been involved in a big ransom-type case, but I can tell you uh, this is this is not my first one. I, I had been involved in one of these things back in, in New York, which was my second office. If you're trying to communicate on a main channel that everybody's on, people are constantly cutting everybody else off and talking over right. each other. So they've given him his own channel just between him and the tail car. Of course, the problem with that was once the tail car left, then nobody else was on that channel. Uh, most of them they didn't even have the, the right crystal in their handset, in their, their radios, to be able to talk to him. So he was in the car with a handy talkie and nobody had talked to. So it was a little scary. Did he change the channel to go to the open channel? He did not. The error was caught, was discovered fairly soon. They they kept trying to to get things arranged. I guess there was problems with uh, Kathy, who was going to make uh, the drop. That's the daughter, and she was. They originally thought about using an FBI agent who kind of looked like her, but they knew the that Chuck had been kidnapped and he had photographs of his kids and everything else. And supposedly Kathy was supposed to be doing it and they just didn't have anybody they thought could pass for Kathy. So she was going to have to do it. They had trouble getting her into a uh, bulletproof vest. So that was one of the problems. And then they had this radio problem. And, and time was starting to uh, 
just passed too uh, too fast, and they were going to be late for the for the drop. The caller was expecting her in about an hour. I think about an hour and a half is about the normal distance from the um, from the house, the Geske house, to this drop off location in Monterey County. So they were already going to be late. So they finally decided they just had to go. So she got in the car, and the SWAT agent with the handy talkie was there. But he was not in contact with anybody. They just started driving. And once we realized that, what they did was uh, the SAC d- dispatched. We had agents all uh, stationed all the way around the Bay Area. And that actually was my job during the course of this uh, thing. Uh, I had been put in charge of uh, coordinating a whole slew of agents. I think there was over 100 agents stationed at key points in bureau cars. Uh, we've had them on early and late shifts for a week now. So there was uh, some real problems with that. I was not a popular person because I was calling all the supervisors around the, uh, the Bay Area and telling them they had to give up four agents or whatever it was you know, for an early shift and a late shift every day because we never knew when the final ransom call was going to come in. And so we had to have people stationed all, all around the area, not 24 hours a day, uh, because we would get uh, the kidnapper would tell us he's going to call, you know, the next day or something like that, so we could tell people to uh, stand down when we got those kinds of calls. But we did have agents stationed all over the place. So once we realized that the bail car that had the radio contact with um, with the handy talkie, with the agent in the car with the handy talkie, as soon as we knew he was not in contact, uh, we dispatched the SEC dispatched two of these standby cars to tail the car all the way down, and they did that. So she was actually uh, protected by two different FBI cars who were following her the whole way. They just weren't in radio contact, and the people in the car didn't know that that was the case. They didn't know they were being tailed by other FBI cars. So it had to be scary for them. Did she ever get the body armor? Was she? You said there were some problems with that. Well, I think she put it on and got in the car and then found it so uncomfortable that she she took it off, if I remember correctly. I may have that wrong. I, I don't remember the details. I certainly wasn't in the car there, but I'm pretty sure that she she just found it too too confining and um, couldn't felt like she couldn't drive right or something and c- couldn't breathe. And so she, she either loosened it or took it off. So there they were. They were driving south. She was the, the driver. The um, SWAT agent was hidden in the backseat area. And um, the other agents w- were following her, but of course they couldn't get too close. It couldn't look like a, a car caravan or the kidnapper would see it. She drove all the way to the drop site. The money had been put in a backpack, which was the instructions from the backpack uh, guy. He, he had told her to drive to dress totally in white. She had to dress in white because uh, he knew this was going to be a nighttime drop and he wanted to be able to spot her and recognize her. So they got to the drop site, uh, which was at the end of this uh, little cul-de-sac or or dead-end road at at the beach, she threw the backpack out of the window and turned around and sped away. So she was safe. And we had the area, uh, the whole general area, surrounded by SWAT and other agents at that point. But we couldn't get too close. We wanted to wait to see if somebody was going to pick up the ransom. And almost immediately, a man in dark clothing jumped out from behind a bush. Remember, this is a beach area. And he grabbed a bag and sprinted down this narrow path uh, towards the water through dunes. There there are big sand dunes in this particular beach, this particular area. So uh, along the way, he discarded a a handgun that he had had. And uh, although we didn't know it at the time, uh, he, he also discarded a backpack. But he kept the money. He pulled the money out and then discarded the backpack. Of course, the backpack had uh, various things on it that would make it traceable or visible. So the agents took off in pursuit once they saw him, but it was uh, pitch black and very foggy that night, too. So uh, when you disappear into an this is an unlighted area, this is uh, a beach now. It's not an urban area. So with deep fog and no no lights, it really was pitch black. So he quickly disappeared and lost the agents. Um, they continued to pursue him in the dark using flashlights. But um, what he did was he went to, uh, all the way to the beach, 
and and then he hung a right, uh, which in this case was north, uh, and ran along the uh, the water line, and that was the only route that wasn't completely closed off. Um, he had apparently abandoned his plan to use that uh, that underwater uh, tow. He had abandoned that plan and uh, running towards the uh, open door of a sand and cement factory that was on the beach there. Uh, was he aware that agents, that somebody was chasing him? Um, I don't know for sure if he was at that point. I think he, I think he assumed that there would be. Let's put it like that. The agents weren't close enough that he could have seen them. Okay, he took off so fast and it was so so dark and foggy that he disappeared in the fog before the agents got the order. Uh, in fact, that, that was a controversy too. The uh, uh, the SAC was in direct contact with the with bureau headquarters on this. There was a a unit chief or section chief back in headquarters who had said that um, as soon as the guy showed up to, to move in and grab him, and in fact the SAC had not uh, obeyed that order and had told the um, the people uh, follow him and see see where he goes. This may not be the real person. I mean that order had been given. Slightly in advance, and it wasn't uh, wasn't uh, planned in long term. It was almost a uh, just a a few seconds before the payoff happened. The SAC decided not to grab the guy right there at the money to let let him go and see where he went. So they tried to follow him, but as soon as he disappeared and couldn't be seen anymore, then the order went out. Okay, well, arrest him, but he was out of sight at that point. And I can tell you that Bureau Headquarters was livid that uh, we had not just grabbed him right there at the site. And I think that had uh, that had reper- repercussions later. But anyway, at that point, uh, the, agent, the, the chase was on. Everybody knew we were going to try to grab this guy. So they were chasing him, but he disappeared into the dark and the fog. And he, uh, he ended up... Uh, at this cement factory, and what it what the cement factory did was it scooped the sand from from the beach. There was a particular current that drove sand in at that point, so the sand wouldn't be depleted, and it it mixed the uh, sand in these giant hoppers with with cement and made uh, made, made cement for construction purposes. And it ran 24 hours a day, so there was a late shift going there. So the kidnapper ran into that plant. And actually tried to bribe the, the guy to drive him out of there. The, the guy turned him down. What happened was he just disappeared into the night uh, when he couldn't get a ride out of there. We don't know exactly what his plan was, but we had the area surrounded. So it became a, a waiting game. Uh, it, more and more agents came pouring in from all over the place surrounding it. But bear in mind, this is a beach, and there were all kinds of access points to the beach. And it was pitch black with heavy fog. No one could really see more than about 10 feet in front of them. So even though there are a lot of agents around, we were definitely not uh, confident that we had the guy uh, surrounded. Uh, we just kept putting more and more people around the area. So it lasted like this all night long. We didn't have the guy. We didn't know where he was. We had the beach area surrounded on all sides. Finally, early the next morning, uh, dawn broke, and a gun was spotted in the foliage near the path. The kidnapper had uh, abandoned the gun when he when he ran off. So we checked it uh, for registration, and it was registered to a man uh, named Al Bukhari in San Jose, uh, and that was a Middle Eastern sounding name. Now, let me just go back a little bit. I think I uh, skipped over something I'd mentioned to say er- earlier. We had had those ransom calls analyzed by a uh, language analyst. Everybody, including me, uh, when we had heard that first ransom call and second ransom call, we thought the guy had a Mexican accent. You know, of course, there's um, a lot of people in California with Mexican accents, and we're, it's a very familiar sound to us. Well, this language expert said that he thought it was an Arabic-speaking person trying to imitate somebody with a Mexican accent. Ooh. Now, if that wasn't the most cockamamie thing, uh, nobody believed that that was the case. But... Um, here, this gun shows up with the name Al Bukhari, a Middle Eastern sounding name. So, surveillance was was set up. Uh, we, we we got the uh, registration address, and it, it was registered to uh, someone in San Jose, which is uh, 
in the same same general area in Silicon Valley near where the kidnapping took took place. The kidnapping itself was in, in Mountain View, which is uh, now part of Google there, but at the time it was Adobe. So anyway, the surveillance was set up on the address and criminal checks were begun. Perhaps 20 minutes later, a man was seen walking in the morning fog on the beach. So he claimed to be a tourist out for a stroll, but his story didn't add up. He was grossly underdressed for the, for the weather. There was a cold fog and wind blowing in off the ocean, and he was shivering. He had no ID on him, and he looked Middle Eastern. And now we had this this gun by this time with the name Albukari connected with it. So he continued to maintain his innocence for hours. But through in investigation of nearby cars, we were able to identify the car. Um, I think he had rented the car, and we were able to identify it and get the registration. The, the name of the driver or the renter was Muhannad Albukari. And the last name, Albukari, was the same as a registered gun owner, who turned out to be the brother of the guy who had rented it. So uh, when we confronted him with that, when I say we, I wasn't there, but the agents who had uh, grabbed this guy, he admitted his identity and agreed to cooperate at that point. As we learned later, he knew he was being chased and he hid in a tree. And that's why he was never spotted. He actually climbed up the skinny... There was. There weren't many trees around, but I guess there was some scrawny little uh, thing that he'd managed to uh, to climb up and hide in the tree. It was aware, he was dressed all in black, and it was pitch black that night, and nobody had seen him. He did tell us later that, yes, he had seen the agents uh, chasing him. So he uh, had hidden under this tree. He knew he couldn't go back to the car, that he would be running right into the agents who were pursuing him. So I don't know if he had another plan. Originally, he had planned to use that underwater tow to uh, escape on the beach, I believe that, and he was just going to abandon the rental car. It was a rental car. He was just going to abandon that. But apparently, uh, we still don't know exactly why he abandoned his plan to use that uh, underwater tow. He was, um, it was probably, I think the waves were just too big for him. It was kind of rough weather that that uh, at that time. So he continued to maintain his uh, innocence, but we finally did identify him as uh, Muhannad al-Bukhari, definitely a Middle Eastern name. And it was the same as the last name of the registered gun owner. Uh, and that, that turned out to be his brother. So um, once he, he finally agreed to cooperate, he told the agents where uh, Chuck was being held. And that was um, about 40 miles away or so. Uh, so meanwhile... Back at the house, um, Chuck Geschke and this other um, kidnapper, his name is Rock, they were awaiting the return of the uh, of the kidnapper with the money, and he did not show up. When he, when he hadn't returned by 3 a.m., Rock began getting very nervous and pacing frantically. Chuck kept talking to him, trying to sow seeds of distrust, saying that Steve had probably betrayed him and run off with the money. And when daybreak came, Rock chained Chuck to the floor at his ankles, but left his hands free as he went outside to look for signs of Steve. So as soon as he knew uh, he was alone, Chuck removed his blindfold and looked around, and he was able to slip the chains because they weren't put on very well. And he uh, sneaked out the back door to escape because this other guy, Rock, had gone out the front door, and he didn't want to run right into him, obviously, so he thought maybe he could escape the other way. So he, he went out the back door, but the, the entire backyard was surrounded by high fences, and Chuck just wasn't able to, to climb the, uh, the fence. Um, he was just not in particularly good shape, and he was feeling kind of sick, too, I think, if, if I remember. Uh, and he was an older man, and these were high fences. There just wasn't any any way for him to get over them. So he decided to go around to the front, and he could go either to the left or to the right. So he went around the side of the house to the street and immediately ran into this guy, Rock, returning to the house. And, uh, and now he had his blindfold off. This is the first time he'd seen Rock. He didn't know what these guys looked like until then. The other guy was the one who had actually held a gun on him earlier. So now Rock uh, realized that his face had been seen. He pulled out a knife and told him he was going to kill him. 
They went back inside, Rock chained him down better this time, and replaced the blindfold. So there were more tense hours of waiting. I can't really describe it all, but uh, Rock told him it was time for Plan B. And when Chuck asked him uh, what that was, he replied, you don't want to know. So that was pretty scary. And in the other room, Chuck heard sounds of digging going on, which was a pretty scary sound under those circumstances, too. So suddenly there was this huge commotion. SWAT and a bunch of other agents swarmed all over the place because, in fact, the other kidnapper, Obukari, had had brought the agents there to that location. And uh, so there was bedlam. Actually, they allowed the kidnapper, Obukari, to get out of the car and go try to convince the other kidnapper, this guy Rock, to surrender. And uh, and Rock didn't agree, and he took off running. So uh, you had agents running after him, and Al-Bukhari uh, stood there, and, and he was already in handcuffs, and he couldn't really get away. So basically, uh, there were people going after both bad guys, and then there was somebody else uh, running into the house to rescue the uh, victim. At that point, uh, Chuck Geschke was back in the closet, uh, handcuffed to the floor, uh, so a couple of agents ran in and rescued him and didn't even believe uh, that it was the FBI at that point. He was so scared. He thought this was all part of the whole kidnapping scenario. But the the other kidnapper, Rock, as he was known, turned out to be uh, Jack Mode Saya was his name. So we had Albuquerque and Saya, both Middle Eastern. So they had the kidnappers. They had the victim who was now freed. Uh, the one piece they didn't have was the ransom money. And they didn't know what happened to it. And it took several days of searching the beach and so forth. But it turns out that's where it was. Uh, by this point, the case agent, who'd been in Disneyland this whole time, uh, was back in, in the division after having had a nice vacation for, for a week. And uh, he, he showed up and um, he, he led the search for the, for the money on the beach. And, and they found it. Chuck, who was rescued, was taken to the San Jose Resident Agency um, and was he was allowed to call home, and of course you can just imagine when uh, what the family was, uh, what their reaction was when they heard his voice. Um, his wife screamed with with joy, and Kathy began to cry. And her brother Peter had been brought in too. He was at the house, so had a couple of uh, family members there, uh, in addition to the to the wife. So obviously every everybody was so so happy. Um, so at that point, another agent and I interviewed Chuck about his whole ordeal uh, while his memory was fresh. Um, he was shown his briefcase, which had been recovered from the location. And on that briefcase, the kidnappers had carved, CMG is dead. Uh, his initials were uh, CMG, Chuck M. Or Charles M. Geschke. So that was intended to be his tombstone. That was wow. quite an exhibit at the trial, I can tell you that. So up to this point, uh, the Mountain View police uh, had never been informed of the case. He'd been kidnapped in Mountain View, where the uh, Adobe headquarters were located, but they had never been told. Whose decision was that, and is that normal, even though you thought he was and it was an interstate kidnapping. Usually, you still would want the local law enforcement to be aware of the activity, if anything. Yes. In fact, the uh, the manual requires that. And what happened is an interesting aspect of the case. The local police were notified, but the SAC made the decision to notify the Los Altos police. Los Altos is where his house was. It's kind of a bedroom community. Um and not the Mountain View police. So that tells me, anyway, that the um, the SAC at that time, and th- this is very early on before we um, actually uh, heard that first recorded ransom call. It, it was uh, when it was reported to us, there had been a ransom call. But I don't think the SAC believed um, Mrs. Geske is basically what happened. So he had told the Los Altos police because he was convinced that Chuck had been either killed or kidnapped there at the house, and Mrs. Geske had driven the car over to the uh, to the uh, b- business where he worked. Okay. 
So the Los Altos police is a much smaller police department, um, doesn't have much commercial um, presence, not a lot of businesses. And uh, that the police chief there was actually a woman, if I remember correctly, at that time, and she had just said, okay, you've told us we can't really handle uh, kidnapping, so you just go ahead and run with us and let us know, and we'll we'll respond if it turns out to be our case. Um, so after we had gotten that first call, I had actually um, urged the SAC to um, to notify the the Mountain View police because once we we were starting to act like it was a real kidnapping, then we began to believe that he had been kidnapped right there at the parking lot uh, where the business was in Mountain View. Uh, that's a a bigger police force with with a fairly large uh, detective contingent, and they would have wanted to, to be involved. But anyway, so so that's what happened. Um, was there any uh, fallout with that police department because of that? Well, I can tell you this. I'm the one who had to sit down with the police officer uh, from Mountain View who was dispatched over to take a report and to take the cannabis into custody. And I can tell you he sure read me the riot act. And uh, I didn't really have a lot of defense about this. But, yeah, I think it strained the relationship uh, to some extent between Mountain View police and the FBI. But um, the one good thing is that it was just run by one agency. You didn't have the Mountain View trying to insert themselves into it. And I'm not saying they would have. I think it's a very pro- professional department that I work with when I was in the San Jose Resident Agency. It was within the RA territory. But it, it did leave it nice and clean for us. And we did have a legitimate uh, reason because the initial call had said that he had been taken to Mexico, which is if he'd been taken out of the state, it was clearly FBI jurisdiction based on the early information. So the fact that he wasn't, this case needed to be prosecuted as a state matter. And so all, everything exactly. that was done now by the FBI now is kind of thrown into the lap of the Mountain View Police Department to exactly. finish up the investigation. Exactly right. And uh, at this point, the uh, case agent who spent his uh, the entire time in Disneyland uh, with his family was back, and he did a, a bang-up job. He did a great job working with the, uh, the Mountain View PD and the district attorney's office uh, on the case. So uh, everything came out fine in the end. Uh, both guys got convicted and got, I believe, 20-year sentences. Remember I told you that briefcase said, who had carved into it, CMG is dead, and we found that at the, uh, the rescue spot. That was Chuck Geschke's own briefcase. And that was made a prominent uh, display there throughout the entire trial. The jury could look at that. And remind them of how this case could have turned out. Exactly. Talking about that, when Chuck heard the digging, was it actually that they were digging a grave for him to be buried in? Yes, that's, that's what we believe. I don't think they ever actually admitted that, but they had taken out the hatch or the door to the crawl space under this uh, thing. And there was a shallow grave being dug. Uh, it okay. wasn't completed. But we think that's what this this other guy, we think that's what he was doing, was preparing to bury him there. And they were going to leave the uh, the briefcase with that carved message somewhere in that house that would eventually be found. Wow. It turned out that the um, Al-Bakari, who is the, the leader of the two, apparently he had come to this country from the Middle East when he was a teenager. And his English was quite good, but he had often been mistaken for a Mexican. You have to understand he was uh, he lived in San Jose, and there, there's a large Mexican population in San Jose. So people who are have black hair and dark complexion uh, often can pass for Mexican or look like Mexicans. People uh, sometimes would mistake him for that. And there's uh, a lot of people had a slight Mexican accent in that area. And so when he was a teenager, he had been mistaken for Mexican and was able to imitate their accent to throw the people off when he was making his calls. He was using that accent. Managed to convince all of us, including uh, one of our supervisors was a Mexican-American, and he thought it was a Mexican-American who was speaking on the phone. I didn't do a very good job of imitating the accent when I read you the uh, transcript of the call. So anyway, the language expert was right about that. I guess that's why he's a language expert. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> and, and it turns out that these guys had learned about Chuck Geschke 
and he had been targeting him because his picture and position had been published in the, the local paper, the San Jose Mercury, as a, one of the new high-tech millionaires. He never did really forgive the Mercury News for, for highlighting him. They hadn't cooperated in that, but they had put his uh, his wealth and his picture on their, their business page, and that's what made him a, a target. There's a number of lessons. Um, I can tell you that uh, for a victim, if you have a chance to escape, you should probably do it, but you really have to weigh whether or not you have a legitimate chance. If, if Chuck had just been a little bit uh, younger and healthier, he could have climbed the fence and escaped. I heard this story from, from his standpoint. He did a marvelous job as a victim. Uh, he was the ideal victim, I tell you. And he convinced him uh, how difficult it would be to get the money. He, he talked them down on the money. He convinced them uh, that the car that um, they had wanted Kathy to drive was not drivable. He said he'd been having problems. So he was able to tell from the feedback on what he was getting from the kidnappers what Kathy was telling the kidnappers. And he was bolstering that by confirming, yeah, the, the only car that really is working is the Cadillac. They couldn't lay their hands on much cash because it's a, he did a great job. I don't want to sound like I'm second guessing what he did, but for the future, if any any of us listening were ever kidnapped, what about at the very beginning when he arrives at work and he is told at gunpoint to get in the car? I know one of the things that you always hear is never let them take you to the second location. I, and I agree with that. And I think in this case, that's true. It, it was a parking lot. And I've been there. In fact, uh, in a strange, uh, remarkable occurrence, I ended up being the security manager after I retired from the bureau. I was the security ma manager for a different company that took over that same spot. So that very spot where he was kidnapped was under my, my jurisdiction as, as the security director there. And um, so I'm very familiar with it. And it's kind of surprising because it's a, it's a big lot. and People come and go. There's several businesses that use that same lot. That was before Adobe became as big as it is now and moved into their San Jose headquarters. And so it was pretty exposed. I think the right thing to do is to run at that point. So I agree with that. But he did have a bad leg, as I recall, Chuck Kefke. So I don't think he could have gotten very far if they had chosen to shoot him. They certainly could have done that, hopped in the car, and got gotten away. And remember, this other guy, Sid, Sidney Riso, back east, he had tried to escape, and he'd been shot and hadn't been able to get away. And then he'd been put into a uh, storage location somewhere where they had locked him in and then not come back. And he had ended up suffering something like a horrible death for three days. I think he died of, of dehydration and bleeding. One of these things that you just don't know uh, the right thing. You have to judge your moment. Do we have any idea of how many of these kidnapping, you know, ransom cases turn out well and how many of them don't, that the, the victims end up dying? It seems to me that in most cases, a rescue is not the outcome. You're probably right. I think we aren't going to know about the ones where the family pays the ransom and doesn't bring in law enforcement. Uh, there could be some of those that we don't even know about. You know, most kidnappings aren't for ransom anyway. Most of them are actually for sexual reasons, I think, uh, or their family kidnappings. So there's never any call for ransom. It's hard to, to make a judgment call, but definitely for the younger people, uh, cases like that, for, for a woman or a, uh, a young child, the best thing to do is to run, uh, absolutely. I think that's their best chance of survival. Kidnapping for ransom is rare, and it's kind of like robbing a bank. Just not a good idea. Very few, at least in this country, uh, very few of them are successful. Um, keep in mind, there are a lot of ways to trace that money afterward. They really can't spend it without eventually leaving a trail, so it doesn't do them much good. A high percent of the real kidnappings for ransom end up being solved and the kidnappers getting caught. So it's not a high percentage crime. So if there's anybody listening who's thinking about doing a kidnapping for ransom, you might want to reconsider. Yes, really. And even though there was skepticism at the beginning um, of whether this was real, the way this was presented to us, uh, the FBI will treat every single case as legitimate until proven otherwise, even if they're skeptical. Thank goodness this case had a successful outcome, and the victim, as my friend Shauna will remind me, 
is actually a survivor. Absolutely. I did want to touch back on the, the fact that you've written a number of mysteries, most of them in your Cliff Knowles mystery series. I will put a, a link to your Amazon author page, so if listeners are intrigued about uh, this case and the other books that you have, they'll be able to go directly to that and uh, check them out. So there'll be a link in this episode's show notes. Let me just add one note on that, just so people don't uh, take things the wrong way. Uh, the book that I wrote that's based on this uh, kidnapping of Chuck Geske is called Held for Ransom, but it is fiction. Um, there's a lot that goes on in there that didn't happen in the real case. You know, you have to build attention and put in some a few humorous things and a few other things. All right, so I'd like to give my guest the last word. What would you like to say? Well, I would say that if you're ever involved as a family member or otherwise in such a, a kidnapping, it's important not only to cooperate, but also to try to appear reasonable. The FBI and police will suspect everyone at first, including family and friends. They have to. But don't be offended. Just keep answering questions. You may provide valuable clues you didn't even know you had. I hope you're never in that situation. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Russ Atkinson, and you'll find links to newspaper articles about this Charles Gresky kidnapping case. You'll also find a link to Russell Atkinson's website and to that mystery book, Held for Ransom, inspired by the Gresky case. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you share it with your friends, family, and associates. If you're listening to this episode by way of a podcast app, you can share it directly from your device. And if you're listening to this on my website, all the social media share buttons are at the bottom of the show notes. And could I ask you for one more thing to subscribe and to review FBI Retired Case File Review. Reviews help listeners find good podcasts. I don't have a crime fiction recommendation for you, but I will next week, so stay tuned. The only thing left to remind you is that my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play, about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry, also inspired by an actual FBI case, is available at Amazon.com as an ebook, trade paperback, and audiobook. So I hope you check it out. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening and hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.